Good afternoon, EMF Camp. My name is James McFarlane, and uh, I'm going to give you a talk about. Uh, it's called. It's called. It's only rocket science. Uh, I uh, blatantly borrowed the title from my wife's book, who, who actually, Dr. Lucy Rogers, who actually wrote the book on rocket science. And um, so, hopefully, we can start off with some noise. Let's see if this works. No, it doesn't work. Right, there we go. Okay, there's no sound. Is there a... Uh, okay. Should I try it again? There we are. That's a, a short rocket firing, give you a, a flavor of what's to come. So, um, I come from a small uh, company in uh, the United Kingdom called Airborne Engineering Limited, and uh, we're only very small, there's about five people, and we work at a, a test site called Westcott. It used, it's now a, a business park, but it used to be the UK's rocket propulsion establishment, which had um, about 1,100 people working on rocket technology back in the Cold War. Uh, and now there are only five space companies here, but we're all doing uh, civilian uh, things for hopefully more peaceful ends. What does a rocket scientist look like? There's an example of a motley crew of rocket scientists. There are, um, basically rockets consist of, rocket science consists of a lot of plumbing, mainly. Uh, so, uh, rocket, so there's not really such a thing as a rocket scientist. It's very multidisciplinary. It involves electronics, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, all kinds of different things. Whatever you like that's vaguely involved in tech, there's something for you in that world. Uh, one of the other skills it's good to have as a rocket scientist is the ability to run away from things very fast. Um, this is one of uh, something in a previous life of mine I was involved with uh, special effects. And you may recognize the uh, vehicle uh, that I'm running away from there as the Reliant Robin Space Shuttle from uh, Top Gear. Uh, why rocket engines? Well, a rocket engine is a very, very effective way of packing a lot of power into a very small space. It's not an efficient means of going a long distance down a road, say, but if you want to go into space, it's absolutely ideal. You can pack a phenomenal density of energy uh, in there, and also it doesn't need any external working fluid to, in order to make it work. So unlike a jet engine, it doesn't need to use the air in the atmosphere. It carries all its own oxygen with it in various different forms, which I'll come on to in a minute. So how do rockets actually work? Well, there was this guy, Isaac Newton, and there's a, an urban myth that he actually invented the cat flap. Um, sadly, I don't think he actually did, but he did come up with three uh, laws of, uh, of motion, Newton's laws, which you've no doubt heard of. And, uh, ooh. Uh, <laughs> um, gosh. <laughs> it's like, uh, so, um, Newton's third law says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So, um, unfortunately, I'm not equipped to demo this today, but if I was stood on a skateboard on the stage, and if I threw something very heavy off to one side, it would push me in the opposite direction. And so, I'm not having to push against the air or against the wall, it's simply the reaction of getting rid of something heavy, uh, and the faster, the harder I push that, that object, the more thrust I'll get, the more momentum I'll get in the other direction. And also, the uh, heavier that object is, the more momentum I'll get. So a rocket engine is all about ways of accelerating stuff to very high speeds. Now, let's uh, look at some different types of rocket engine. The first one we'll look at is uh, something very, very familiar. This is what you'd use on November the 5th. This is called a solid propellant rocket, or otherwise known as a rocket motor. Um, the word rocket engine implies all sorts of gubbins like pipes and valves and pumps and things. And this is really, really simple, so it's sometimes just called a rocket motor. It has a, um, a, a core of solid propellant, which is kind of like a very fast-burning fuel or a slow-burning explosive, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, it could be classed as an explosive. It doesn't, it's not designed to explode in a solid rocket motor, but if something goes wrong, it can do, which means that testing solid rockets has an added frisson of danger, which makes it interesting. Uh, the next type of rocket, which is the one I'm going to talk about mostly in this talk, is the bipropellant rocket. And I should say, uh, this applies both to, to most of the rockets that, that we're going to look at on these next few slides. Those rockets have what's called a fuel and an oxidizer. And you need to bring those two things together and burn them in order to work. So the way a rocket works is it ejects stuff at very high speed, and that stuff is usually a gas. And... Uh, we can eject it at a high speed to get a lot of thrust, 
by accelerating it very, very fast. And to do that, we need some energy. And that energy comes usually from burning stuff. That isn't universally true, as we'll see in a minute. But in most rockets, that energy comes from a chemical reaction between the two propellants. And so most rockets need a fuel and an oxidizer. So if you went and had a campfire tonight, you're burning a fuel, which is wood, and the oxidizer is actually the oxygen in the air. In a rocket, you put those two components in tanks, uh, although there aren't very many wood-fueled rockets. The uh, bipropellant rocket, as you see, it's got a red tank for the fuel and a blue tank for the oxidizer on this slide. It's got some pumps to squirt it into the combustion chamber. And then the combustion chamber at the end is where those are combined. And they're squirted in continuously. It's not pulsed, it's squirted in continuously, the fuel and the oxidizer, through little nozzles, like a, like a shower head. And that's to help the two components mix together very, very thoroughly. Uh, in order that they can burn properly before they exit the nozzle. And if you don't get that right, then your rocket engine is not very efficient. So a lot of my job is to do with figuring out whether the injectors in a rocket engine is working, are working properly. We'll come more onto the components of that rocket engine in a minute. So number three is a hybrid rocket, and of course the word hybrid just means uh, a combination of two things, and that's exactly what it is. It's a combination of a solid rocket and a liquid rocket. In the uh, tank, which is colored blue on that slide, you can see the oxidizer there, and the fuel that it burns with is actually a solid inside the combustion chamber. So there's a liquid there, a liquid oxidizer and a solid fuel. That's why it's called a hybrid, because there's two different things in different states. And just like a bipropellant rocket, it's got a nozzle at the end, which will, has a slight constriction in order to accelerate the gases out of the end. There's a couple of other types of rocket engine, which I'll mention briefly. One is a monoprop, and that works by taking a chemical and decomposing it with a catalyst. So very similar to the catalyst in your exhaust, in your car. Um, that catalyst helps one chemical break down into multiple chemicals, and in doing so, it releases energy. These are very popular on satellites for maneuvering the satellites once they're in space. And uh, you can see on that slide, it's got a nozzle, just like the other rockets you've seen. And the bit on the back is a, a valve. And then in the middle, there's a catalyst pack, which is the bit that looks like it's been a bit singed, because it gets quite hot. So with po apologies to Henry Reid, we have the naming of parts. This is, really relates to what I'm going to be talking about in the next few slides. We've got the combustion chamber, which is on the left-hand side. And into the combustion chamber, you squirt the fuel and the oxidizer under pressure. You also need an igniter to start the rocket going, and uh, that can be all kinds of different things. It can be a spark. Um, when we do the demonst demonstration later, you'll see it's actually an indoor sparkler. Um, but in the big rockets, it's usually something a bit more sophisticated than that. We've then got the uh, throat of the, of the rocket, and that's very, very important. That's the point at which the gases that are created in the combustion chamber reach Mach 1. So they reach a, a sonic velocity at the throat. And due to the wonderful laws of thermodynamics, everything downstream of that will be acceleration. So you can then start to expand again, and you can get your uh, exhaust gases up to about Mach 2 or 3 as they reach the exit of the, of the rocket nozzle. And uh, the, uh, the thing there is, is you're getting as much energy out of those propellants as possible by trying to accelerate them to the maximum speed. And that's what the job of the nozzle is. It's to give you, um, to take the energy you've, you've created in the combustion chamber and actually turn it and get the most bang for your buck. So I'll be talking about that in a little more detail in the slides that follow. In fact, the nozzle is really quite important in certain applications. And so here's a, another example of why you want a rocket. This is a thing called Skylon. You may have heard about it. It's a space plane created by a company in the UK. It started off in the 1980s as a concept called HOTOL, and it's evolved. Um, the three guys, after they cancelled the project, the British government cancelled yet another rocket project, yay, um, they actually left and set up their own company called Reaction Engines, and they've now gone from like three guys in a shed to being about 100 people in an office in uh, Cullum, and they're doing really, really well. This a uh, spacecraft is able to take off from a runway and fly all the way to the edge of to, into space, into orbit, deliver a satellite. It can even pick up things, uh, so it could take away things that have finished their job to reduce space junk, take them back in again, and fly back down, land on a runway, and it could be reused in about four hours. There's a similar concept. You can take the same kind of engine technology and you could apply it to a stratospheric cruise aircraft, which could cruise at Mach 5, and that would allow you to do London, Sydney in four hours. You could then have a day trip to Australia, which would be really, really cool. I think that's a bit of a way off, but the technology is, is actually progressing and it, 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 it is theoretically possible. One problem that this rocket has that a lot of traditional rockets don't have, you probably remember th seeing things like the Saturn V launches on YouTube or whatever, and more recently Elon Musk's SpaceX rocket, 
A lot of those rockets work by having multiple stages. Now, there's various mathematical reasons for having a multi-stage rocket, which I won't go into. Uh, there was a chap called Sioikovsky discovered why you need to do this at the turn of the century, the last century. But one of the problems is, with Skylon, because it only uses one stage, those nozzles have to work in, in the, each different environment that the rocket finds itself in. So they have to work well at sea level, and they have to work well when it's in the vacuum of space. And uh, this can present a bit of a problem for rocket nozzles, uh, as I show you on the next slide. Now, the way that the gas flows in the rocket nozzle, what you ideally want to do is expand it until it reaches the same pressure as the environment that you're in. Now, if you make, uh, however, if you make your nozzle too big, then the gases will detach from it and they'll slow down again. And another problem happens, you can see there on the side, slide on the left, that white area is where the flow is detached from the inside of the rocket nozzle. And um, this not only generates a suction, which is trying to suck you back down again, which is not what you want, because you want as much thrust as possible, but also it can generate a lot of structural forces in the rocket nozzle, which can destroy it, because that flow is not necessarily uh, symmetrical in the way it separates, and it can sort of wobble around like a jelly, and it can destroy the rocket nozzle. So ideally, you want it to be like the third one in, where the flow is coming out parallel. But the problem is, at sea level, you want a short nozzle. And when you get into space, you want a really big nozzle in order to get the most bang for your buck. And uh, with a traditional nozzle, which is these shapes that I've shown you so far, these are called bell nozzles, that's not really possible. However, there are different types of nozzle where the flow can automatically compensate for the altitude that the rocket flies at. So the higher you go, the more of the nozzle it uses up automatically, just by the laws of thermodynamics and aerodynamics, which is quite wonderful. And so my uh, little company's been doing a lot of research on that kind of nozzle, called an expansion deflection nozzle. And uh, we started in uh, 2007 with this program. Now, you'll notice a little bit of a theme developing with the names of these engines. Don't blame me, I didn't start it. The guy who's come up with these names has actually been banned from naming any more rocket engines. But um, what you will notice, the, the, the key thing to take away, they all begin with the letter S. That's simply traditional because uh, liquid propellant, bipropellant rocket engines that have been made in the UK generally have been named with the letter S. Uh, back, way back into the 1950s, 60s. So we then moved on to a slightly, um, as you can see, this is called Strict, this one here. Um, this is a slightly more detailed experiment, which we did with Bristol University and reaction engines. And we tried to figure out exactly what the shape of the inside of that shiny copper bit is. So that's the nozzle that you're seeing there. And you might be able to see up in the middle of it is that little mushroom-shaped uh, pintle that you saw in the previous diagram. So if I go back to there, that little mushroom on the bottom is the bit that you can see up in the middle of that uh, copper uh, area in the thing. I don't know. If I point that laser on, does that actually work? Probably not. No? Okay. Never mind. We also had a brief look at some of the theory behind this idea of cruising in the stratosphere, which is quite exciting. One of the problems that has is that it makes uh, nitric oxide, which depletes the ozone layer. Any engine makes nitric oxide, any combustion engine, and it's not really a problem at sea level. In fact, it's probably good for plants, but in the stratosphere, it's really bad. So we did a little study to try and reduce the emissions so that if someone did make one of these aircraft where you could fly and do a day trip to Australia, then it wouldn't cause any harm to the environment. And that's, that's actually really, really successful. So this is an example of blue sky technology trying to debug the problems before somebody comes along and actually builds one of these things for real. Back onto nozzles, uh, you'll see another one beginning with S. This, this one's called Strident. This is what's called a cold flow nozzle. Um, it runs off a of cold gas, which is air in this case, because it's cheaper than building a rocket that will stand the high temperatures. Um, that's a jellyfish. Um, ask, me, ask me about that later. Um, now, uh, I'm afraid this is, I think this is pretty much the only slide, slide I've got which actually looks like PowerPoint, boo hiss. Um, now, this is the third engine that we came onto. Uh, well, it's actually the fourth if you, count, count the, if you count the cold flow one. And it's called Stoic. And uh, this, is, um, this presented us with a number of problems. So my company was asked to test these engines. So our customer gives us the engine. We bolt it down to a test stand at Westcott, and we, put, we plumb up all the fuel that it needs and all the systems to provide the pressure to squirt them in. And we fire them, and we measure lots and lots of different things. This one presented a particular challenge because it runs off gases and the gases come from a bottle of gas and as you use the gas, the pressure in the bottle goes down. 
That wasn't a problem before because we had very, very short times of duration of operation of the rocket engine, very short burns, as you'll see in a minute. As we move into this program, we had to do a much longer burn where we had to regulate the gas flow in real time. Now, unlike in school physics, you, you learn about ideal gases. When you put air into a rocket at 200 bar, it's not an ideal gas. It's a supercritical gas. And if you treat it as an ideal gas, you make about an 11% error in the performance. So all of this prov provided some interesting challenges. And we couldn't buy a regulator off the shelf to do this. So this is what we started with. For our previous rockets, we just had a valve and a guy with a spanner to turn the valve. Um, and I should say he doesn't have to stand there when the rocket's firing. What, he, uh, he, otherwise, he'd, he'd have bad hearing. He has to actually tweak this in between each rocket test. And it's kind of fiddly, because you don't know whether you got it right till you fire the next one. So we had to come up with something better. And we came up with this, which is called the automatic metering valve. And this can measure the flow of the gas. It's got a venturi on the left-hand side, which measures the flow of gas by looking at the change in pressure. And it's got then a pintle, which moves in and out under control of a big linear motor, linear actuator, in order to control the gas. And um, this works really, really well. And we can dial in any combination of propellant flows we like. And this is quite important for our customer, because they want to demonstrate the transition of this rocket engine to running on air breathing mode, where Skylon is sucking in the air from the atmosphere and burning it with hydrogen, to when it leaves the atmosphere, it has to transition that rocket engine to actually run on its internal liquid oxygen supplies. Um, this is the thing with a space plane, it has to transition. So no one's done this yet, no one's demonstrated this on a test rig. So we hope to be the first people to do this. And we did this with the aid of um, some, some ingenuity and a wonderful open source software uh, package, yay open source, uh, which is a Python thing called, called CoolProp. And there's their logo, is that little thing that looks like a phase diagram. So I should say all our instrumentation is open source, it all runs on Linux. Um, so we went from a prototype of this valve, as you can see there, it's the, the pipe comes in from the ceiling and goes downwards through that sort of bit with the blue bits on. That's the actual metering valve. Uh, so it's that picture. If you turn that on its end, turn it through 90 degrees, that's what you're seeing coming down from the ceiling in the middle of the slide. The bit at the bottom of the slide is a calibration nozzle, a cold flow nozzle, so that we can see if it worked. And we calibrated it, and we got really, really good results. You can see it's a bit noisy. Um, that's the thing we hired to do the calibration was noisy, not our thing. And you can see that all of those lines all line up together, which means that it worked really, really well, and we got all of our sums right, and we were very happy. So then we put that into production. We made four of them. So production for us is like four, ten things. It's not mass production. Um, so we can control two different flows of hydrogen and a flow of air and a flow of oxygen to demonstrate this transition of the rocket engine. And what it looks like complete, this is the stoic engine with the um, uh, completed rig. Without further ado, let's see if we can uh, show you a picture of it, a video of it actually firing. This is firing through a thing like a Stargate thing. It's actually a noise suppression system. This is to do with us being good neighbors. We're actually suppressing the sound that it makes by squirting lots of water in to try and make it quieter. And if I press this button, hopefully, that's the sound of the cooling water going through it. Then you'll hear the igniter, which is like a screech. And then the rocket will fire up there. The so you can see it fires for a very, very short period of time. And that's because the nozzle's made out of copper. It's, uh, it's great for short durations, but we need a cooling system on it, and we haven't got the cool nozzle yet because our customer hasn't made it yet. So uh, let's go back uh, and just do that again, So, because it's quite good fun. So there's the cooling water flowing through it for the bits that are cooled. Then you'll hear the igniter. There it goes. There's the, the, main, uh, the main flow. The, the big uh, flame you see at the end is the excess hydrogen burning off at the end. Then, uh, just for uh, shiggles, we can see the same thing in infrared. Uh, you notice the flame wasn't very visible. This is a characteristic of hydrogen flames. They're really, really hard to see, and this actually can have safety implications. But if you've got an infrared camera, you can see exactly what's happening. Oh, no, is it... Uh, it might take a while to, uh, to play. We'll have to be patient. There's no sound on the infrared camera, so... You can see the big glow in the background, that big white glow is actually the compressor that makes the compressed air that runs the rocket. There it goes, yeah. 
Then um, we also were successful with our instrumentation, with all of the measurements. We had to measure 64 different pressures distributed down the, the wall of the rocket nozzle to see whether that flow was detaching. So you remember that slide with the, the red and yellow um, flow diagrams. We wanted to see whether it was doing the right thing. So we had to make a lot of pressure measurements and sample them all simultaneously at, at, at 10,000 times a second. So we needed to build a lot of instrumentation to do this. But we were quite successful, and you can see there some of the results um, that we got from that that demonstrates a change in the flow pattern. And uh, because it's cool, we also decided to do an animation of the, of the uh, pressure distribution in the nozzle. You can see the bottom graph is the chamber pressure, so that's the pressure inside the combustion chamber. And then above it, all these little dots are hopefully going to dance up and down in a second and show us what the pressure distribution is in the rocket nozzle. And you'll see there's a little red dot that moves along the grass, graph, a little ball, uh, that will show you where the um, where, where it relates to. Let's see, does that actually... Oh, it. No, it's not moving on my screen, but it might be moving on your screen. Is it moving? Let's try that. There we go, yep, yeah, there we are. And it should... Uh, it should repeat, but it doesn't. There we are. So you can see that um, with all the measurements we had, we were able to demonstrate what the flow is doing and make our customer very happy because uh, all of their aerodynamicists who are working out what's happening inside the nozzle could go and uh, validate their model. And so on that previous slide there, you see the, the, uh, the red and uh, blue dots. That was what the uh, computer model says. And then, um, in fact, actually, no. Um, that's right, that's what the model does, and then on this one it shows you what it actually does in real life, which I'm, sadly I haven't got the two things on the same slide, so I'll move on. Uh, we also did a spectrogram, which shows the, uh, we're looking for any oscillations in the rocket engine, and that would show us as a, as a high energy peak on that graph if we had any, um, any oscillations. In rocket engines, if they oscillate, they'll probably blow up any minute, so we wanted to avoid that. And uh, I think I've uh, just about got time to talk about something else a little bit different. You may have seen this in uh, America. They've got this wonderful thing called Morpheus, uh, which is an Armadillo Aerospace and NASA project. This thing will take off, and it can hover, and it can move sideways, and it can land in a different place, and it's a demonstrator for landing on Mars. So this will allow you to try out all your technology you need in order to fly a rocket on Mars and to land it safely. It's the kind of technology that went into the, um, all the Mars rovers to actually get them on the surface correctly and safely. And... Uh, we thought we wondered, well, can we build one of these in the UK? So, um, as all good things, you start off with a CAD model. Um, but we like to turn things into reality, so uh, that's what it looks like in real life. And uh, we've, uh, we've just static fired this to make sure that the rocket engine works properly. And we're on the brink of being able to actually fly this on a tether, and then hopefully we'll be able to free fly it somewhere, uh, if we can find somewhere that there aren't too many things to break. So, uh, hopefully this will show a picture of the static firing. You can see the blast deflector is getting really hot. We could have put some water on it to cool it, but it's, um, it nearly melts through. You can see it's actually glowing, uh, glowing white hot there at the end. Um, <laughs> it's better this way, yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> so um, we, uh, we're kind of progressing with this, but it's one of these side projects which we're not really being paid for, so you know, we can do it when we work on it when we can. And so without further ado, um, I'm going to do a live demonstration of a rocket engine on stage. It's a static firing, so it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to be, hopefully it'll stay here on this bench and not go anywhere. <laughs> I... I uh, I could say at this point, trust me, I'm a rocket scientist, but uh, um, that would be a huge cliche. Um, the way this rocket's going to work, if I take the thing off here. Does that work? Oh, wonderful, okay. Hang on a minute, I'm going to put on my lab coat, because then it'll look more like science. Now, the, the way this rocket works, this is a hybrid rocket, and uh, you can see on the slide there, on the right-hand side is a tank of oxidizer. In our case, this is oxygen. So um, here's a big tank of oxygen here. That's the oxidizer. 
And it's just a gas, not a liquid. Liquid oxygen is very cold. It's very uh, difficult to transport to, uh, to um, events like this. Um, and it's slightly more dangerous. And uh, that comes up this pipe here in through a valve and into the back of the rocket engine. Although it has a solid fuel in here, unlike a solid propellant rocket like a firework, you can actually turn it off, so it's actually much safer. You can actually control it. And what we've done here, the fuel is made of a plastic called acrylic, which is actually safe to burn in this instance. We drill the hole up the middle of it, so the uh, oxygen will come in through this pipe into the combustion chamber. It'll burn on the inside of that fuel grain, and uh, you'll see a, a bright white light here that will, and, and hopefully you'll see that light get bigger as it uses up the fuel, but I'm going to turn it off before it burns all the way through to the outside because, you know, I don't want to set fire to anything. We do have a fire extinguisher and we have a fireproof mat here. Um, this is what the fuel grain looks like when it's burnt. You can see it's got a bit of a bulge in the middle, but it, it starts off as about a 13 mil diameter hole and then it gets bigger as it, as it burns. There's a, it's like a cross section there, you can see. So I'm going to need to call on my um, beautiful assistant at this stage, Dr. Lucy Rogers. Uh, you may know her from uh, shows such as Robot Wars. Um, and she's going to do a, uh, a very important job, which is to light the rocket engine, because uh, I need all hands to, uh, to control the valves. So uh, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to put the microphone down. I won't put it in the way of the rocket engine, because I'm sure it's a very expensive microphone. Here we go. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. And that shows the controllability of hybrid rockets. You could see I could turn it up and down just by regulating the pressure of the oxidizer uh, coming into the engine. So um, I think we, have we got time for questions? We've got, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry. <laughs> so we got 10 minutes, but counting you need to tear down as well. So a couple of questions maybe. If, yeah, you, so if you have a question, question, please raise your hand and I will bring the mic. I can't see anyone who's asking questions because I've got the lights here, so I have to, my assistant will there. Hello, um, you're uh, expanding the def uh, deflection nozzle. Yes. How do you plan calling the pintle in the middle? Sorry, say that again, sorry? How do you plan calling the pintle in the middle? Because it's going to be in the hottest part of the engine. That's a very good question indeed, yeah. It's actually, in, in the engines that we have at the moment, that pintle is uh, it's just a solid lump of copper. And that's one of the reasons why we can't run for more than about one and a half seconds. In the full-size engine, that pintle is actually water-cooled. Or, oh, sorry, I, I tell a lie. It's, it's not water-cooled, it's propellant-cooled. So it has a cooling jacket around it, and we squirt some of the propellants through it. But on our test rig, the next stage will be water-cooled because it's easier to measure the amount of heat going in if you use water because you can just look at the temperature difference coming in and out. So you're quite right, um, ED nozzles do have a problem with cooling. The final version of that engine, in fact, um, a Sabre 4, isn't exactly an ED nozzle. So I'm not sure how much I can say at the moment, but um, it, it's not quite the same as an ED nozzle and it doesn't have quite the same uh, cooling problems that an ED has, but it's more or less similar from a theoretical perspective. 
Any more question? Please ra raise your hand over there. I'm going to take this off because it's really hot in here. What was with the jellyfish? Ah. Oh. Um, has anyone here read a book called The Art of Electronics? Yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful book on electronics. If you want to learn electronics, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, my, Lucy very kindly got me a signed copy, and uh, one of the authors, uh, Paul Horowitz, um, went on the internet and looked me up, and he found a previous version of this talk, and uh, I had a lot of problems with the, with the slides, and it kept going to the screensaver, and there was a jellyfish on the background of my colleague's laptop, and so he wrote in the inscription, Dear James, please enjoy the book. By the way, nice jellyfish. So I thought... <laughs> I, it's kind of become a tradition to have a jellyfish. Some, that particular jellyfish, I'm not an expert on them, but it's called a Pacific sea nettle, in case anyone wants to, uh, to know that. Um, it's got nothing to do with rockets at all. Rocket-powered jellyfish, that would be very dangerous, wouldn't it? Really? <laughs> any, any more questions? There's one at the, someone at the back there, with the hand up on the right-hand side, and uh, stage right. Should I go first, then? Okay. Oh, hi. Um, I you, see you. <laughs> hi. Yeah, hi yeah. Um, you said um, most of your um, stuff was open source. Does that mean your equipment that you're developing as well? That's a good question. We've used a lot of open source software. So far, we haven't uh, put any of our software available on the net. Well, that's not entirely true, actually. There's, a, there's a, a thing that we've developed called TouchBridge for controlling all the valves and the rocket engine, which is kind of really the subject of another talk. That is on GitHub. That's the first thing we've actually, that we've made, that we've made available uh, openly. Um, we're hoping to open source a lot more of the software we use for the data logging system, uh, but the code base is a bit sketchy, so we want to get it a bit more fine-tuned before we put it on GitHub. But yes, ultimately, um, some of the things we do are sensitive to our customers, so we can't do that, but uh, ultimately we want to give back to the community that we've taken from because we've um, we, open source software has allowed us to do things which cost big aerospace companies absolutely you know millions of pounds because they have to go and buy all these you know enterprise grade things and we can just use uh, Python and it's wonderful. So. Um, the rocket hardware is not open source. We think that the, um, the data acquisition stuff is kind of how we make our money, so we are starting to sell that as a spin out to other people. So we probably won't open source the hardware, but we may open source the firmware, possibly. We, we haven't decided yet. Okay, I think you could make a wood-based rocket if you do a Google search for heat logs. <laughs> Oh, right, okay. I, I, do, I do know um, people have made hybrid rockets out of lots of crazy things. I've seen someone fire a hybrid rocket made out of Snickers bars and another one made out of salami because anything with any fat or hydrocarbons, carbohydrate will, will act as a fuel. So if you put enough oxidizer through it and if you get it hot enough, then it'll burn. So I, I think we've still got, still got a bit more, maybe a couple more questions, then I better probably tidy up before the next uh, speaker. There's so, someone here. Hello. Uh, you mentioned Scalon and Reaction Engine before. Yes. Are you still working with them and planning to work with them in the future? Yes, um, we're working with them at the moment. Um, we are that, that engine you, call, you, you saw called Stoic, that's an ongoing program. We're still working on that. We're working up to longer duration firings. We hope to be able to fire it for about eight seconds when we have the new cooling system. And uh, we've got another project starting with them to look at testing materials that might be used in rocket combustion chambers uh, where we'll actually get to play with liquid oxygen and liquid methane, so cryogenic rocket propellants, uh, which is uh, sort of a new thing for us, but it's pretty you know, industry standard, but there's not many people in the UK doing what we do. In fact, there's not really anyone doing, doing exactly what we do. There are a few companies doing um, uh, thrusters for satellites and things like that. They're, they're actually, um, one of the companies we uh, are on the same site with, they've, one of their rocket engines went into orbit around Jupiter on the Juno mission and it fired, having been on that rocket for five years and it worked perfectly, so that was a good success story. Um, yeah, well, Hello. one more question? Hi, um, the, uh, over here, oh. probably can't see anyway. Uh, the Mythbusters used uh, gummy bears as a solid fuel and they also used dog feces. Uh, not <laughs> condoning it, just putting it out. Um, you mentioned before that the nozzle hadn't been made by your customer yet. Who are your customers? That is Reaction Engines. That's Reaction Engines Limited. 
Yeah, They're, so they're the Skylon, the Skylon space plane people. Uh, but yeah, um, that's very interesting. That, that was Mythbusters, you said. Use, use dog poo as a rocket, as a fuel. That's, um, yeah. I wouldn't want to be near that. That's, uh, <laughs> um, maybe one more question? You can come and find me afterwards, by the way. Oh, I should have put it on my slides. I'm at Rocket Engines on Twitter. And that's at Rocket Engines, plural, not singular. That's someone totally different. Hi there. Yeah. Um, kind of what uh, advantages is your um, mushroom rocket nozzle uh, supposedly going to have over an aerospike nozzle? Um, uh, Aerospike is, is another way of doing altitude compensation. So it's doing the same, solving the same problem that an ED nozzle is solving. Um, the problem with Aerospike nozzles is I think the cooling can be even worse than uh, an ED, although there's some debate about that. But one of the other problems is they're quite heavy. Um, so people have tried them. I know some people in America tried them even on a, a solid rocket motor. Um, and it's another way of solving that problem. But we're, we're kind of sticking to uh, like a coaxial uh, ED type of nozzle rather than aerospikes. Because I, I think in this particular context, they'd be a bit too heavy for this, this space plane. Well, thank you very much.